I tend to measure an art piece's worth by how interesting the thoughts I'm having with it are, and Half-Life 2 is a perfect example of why. This all comes down to one key word, subtlety. Anyone who's seen my Thief 2 videos will know I'm a big fan of subtlety. I want to have to put in the work to understand the full breadth of the story. It adds a sense of discovery that games can be especially good at capturing. While the Half-Life series is a linear story with relatively few spoken lines, there's so much going on in the story that isn't directly explained to you, to the point where I'm still learning new things about the story and world, nearly 12 years after I first played Half-Life 2. This stuff applies to Half-Life 1 also, though not quite as much. There will be spoilers for all of the Valve-directed Half-Life games and Opposing Force from here on out. Just look at the Half-Life 1 chapter, Questionable Ethics. The game expects us to understand the implications behind finding laboratories full of caged hound eyes. The Black Mesa team has been doing experiments on the aliens, and of course, that means they knew about them well before the Resonance Cascade. Not to mention the factories in Zen filled with passive Vortigaunts. Without a single word, this confirms that the Vortigaunts are indeed brainwashed, and that they're being used to manufacture soldiers for some sort of alien overlord, who we'll eventually find out is the Combine. That also explains the shackles the Vortigaunts are forced to fight in. I love this stuff. It makes the game feel so much bigger than it is, because there's no telling what else you might have missed in the story. There's a very good chance that the Nihilanth was trying to hold a portal to Earth open so that the enslaved aliens could escape the Combine, but that whole theory deserves a video of its own. On to Half-Life 2. From the very moment you start Half-Life 2, your mind is filled with questions, most of which can actually be answered very quickly if you pay attention to the nuances of the world. What happened to the aliens? Well, there's a Vortigon sweeping trash behind a fence in the beginning. They're probably still enslaved. Where am I? Well, there's some sort of European language on a lot of the walls, and the man giving the speech on the monitor says, Welcome to City 17. This world is so heavily controlled that its cities are numbered. The fact that we're only in City 17 tells me that there probably aren't many cities left in the world. Who's this guy on the screen? I thought so much of City 17 that I elected to establish my administration here, in the Citadel so thoughtfully provided by our benefactors. Huh. He must be some sort of leader, but he's not really the one in charge. It's whoever these benefactors are. Probably the ones who enslaved the Vortigaunts. The flying camera just took a picture of me. This is clearly some sort of hyper-secure rule over Earth. I wonder why they haven't just brainwashed us all yet. Wait, G-Man said wake up and smell the ashes. Is it my fault that humanity has been taken over by this Orwellian master race? We haven't even taken 30 steps, and the player's mind is already racing, asking tons of questions and figuring out tons of answers. It takes 10 seconds in City 17 to have the plight of the entire human race explained to you indirectly, and it only gets more interesting from there. Next up, we meet some humans, and learn how paranoid and downtrodden they've become, and the next transmission from Breen explains why. A suppression field is employed by the Combine to make all of humanity sterile, and as Breen gives a speech explaining its purpose to concerned citizen, we start to understand Breen a bit better. There's a ton of subtext in this second Breen speech should you choose to stay and listen to the whole thing. Breen talks about instinct like it's some sort of primitive aspect of humanity that we need to grow out of, and maybe he has a point there, but it also makes us question whether Breen has already been brainwashed, or if he's just fooled himself into swallowing the Combine's propaganda so that he can keep his seat of power. Does he really have humanity's best interests at heart, or is he just looking out for himself? Is he even real? The Combine can probably simulate a human face and speech if they have the technology we've seen so far. This is how you do intrigue. You'd be hard-pressed to find someone who wasn't excitedly waiting to see Breen in person after listening to the speech in game. And what's so cool is that everything I've said so far is left for the player to ask themselves and discover. None of this is expressed in cutscene. It's up to the player to pick up the scraps of the world and rebuild it in their head. It feels like we're writing some crazy fan theory as we learn about the world, but in reality, we're just putting together the puzzle pieces. Before we move on, I'd like to tie off one last tangent I left open. The reason the Combine don't just brainwash all of the humans is because of our scientific prowess. I think it's fair to say this early on that the Combine don't have teleporter technology, because otherwise Kleiner and Eli would be trying to figure out how to crack that, rather than develop our own teleporters. This is, of course, confirmed in Episode 2, when we learn that the Combine is after the Aperture Science Research ship Borealis. We'd be here for hours and hours if I were to list all of the little things that build on the world like I have been so far. So let's take a look at how the game subtly contextualizes new gameplay scenarios. There are a couple of great ways this is done. 
One of my personal favorites is the city scanners. You'll be going about your business during some of the game's downtime, and suddenly one will pop around the corner or fly in from the ceiling and snap your picture. Then, by the time you turn the corner, Metro Cops will already be there. It's a great way of foreshadowing a combine ambush, while also contextualizing their presence in what would otherwise be a totally random places. But it also showcases just how powerful the Combine are. The moment one of their thousands of city scanners sees you, it takes 30 seconds for tons of cops to be deployed at your location. Maybe a little unrealistic, but it gets you to be afraid of an enemy that's almost completely harmless on purely mechanical terms. If you just spawn one in using commands, all it can do is take your picture and temporarily blind you. But in practice, it's a great bit of foreshadowing to a lot of the game's encounters. Another, much less subtle way of signifying a larger fight is the way that some of the cops are scripted to shoot up flares when they see you. This is a bit less believable, seeing as the cops would probably have live feeds like the city scanners do, but it's a universal language. You see someone fire a flare before they start shooting you, you know you need to get out of there. From a purely arcade standpoint, the game would be just as fun without these touches, but of course, games are about much more than mechanical fun, and just like its predecessor, Half-Life 2 is a fantastic example of how much fun a game can be while still being focused on theming and narrative, rather than purely gameplay. Another thing that happens a handful of times is Gordon encountering the fractured communications between Rebel outposts. This is Station 8! We heard 12, go down and out! I'll bet at least half of the people listening never caught this tiny bit of storytelling. When you first get the airboat, you're told to meet some rebels at a red barn around the river, and eventually you find the red barn with nothing but headcrab zombies and an empty headcrab canister smashed through the ceiling. It makes you wonder if the Combine can intercept the Rebellion's emergency transmissions, or if their information networks are just vast enough to know where these rebel stations are. Either way, this makes for a great segue into one of my favorite subtle touches in the Half-Life games. Gordon inadvertently gets tons of his allies killed, be they rebel or scientist. We all know about the elevator from Half-Life 1, but remember this moment? That suit of yours is full of tracking devices. Based on what we see in Half-Life 2, I'd say it's safe to say that the Combine eventually find out how to tap into those tracking devices, which is why we see moments like this, in which surgical strikes that were clearly directed at Gordon end up getting more of the Rebels killed. Or moments like this. This is how it always starts. First the building, then the whole block. They have no reason to come to our place. Don't worry, they'll find one. Sure enough, moments later, Gordon enters the building and the Metro Cops instantly raid it. Once again, Gordon basically got all of these people killed, and yet they're still giving their lives for him. Somehow, I doubt anyone made it out of Station 10 after they gave Gordon their airboat. Then, of course, there's the fact that Gordon leads the Combine into Black Mesa East. You have my gratitude, Doctor. First you lead me straight to the doorstep of my oldest friend, then you deliver yourself compromising the greatest human-led research facility on Earth, with the possible exception of White Forest. After the Combine's raid on Black Mesa East, they captured Eli, and I think it's fair to assume that they also learned a great deal more about our teleportation experiments, which is, of course, the main thing that keeps the human mind from being obsolete in the Combine's eye. Before I go into a lunatic's rant in the final section of this video, I'd like to point out what is, in my opinion, the most subtle, genius thing in the whole Half-Life series. Breen is still alive. That might not be news to you. As we ride the elevator up to his office in the climax, we overhear him talking to a Combine advisor about a host body. There's no way I can survive in that environment. A host body? You must be joking. I can't possibly- Yes, he is! Oh, all right. Damn it. That's what it takes. Just hurry. He's right behind me. This is, of course, an advisor body. The Breen that we kill in the end of Half-Life 2 was supposed to be killed. Possibly as a diversion, maybe just to fool us. In Episode 1, we even see Breen's advisor being created, and instantly lashing out at Alex and Gordon from within its pod. This is why, at the end of Episode 1, when the Citadel is finally collapsing, we see countless advisor pods launched out of it. Like I said, you've probably heard that one before, but what if I told you that we actually meet Breen's advisor in episode 2, and it tries to kill Gordon and Alex? When this advisor first wakes up from its pod, we see it test its new abilities on an oil drum and by mind probing a corpse, then it notices Gordon, and even after being injured, it never takes its gaze off of Gordon for a second. The way it locks eyes with you, as far as I'm concerned, makes it basically certain that this is Breen's advisor, and in spite of the damage it takes, it does indeed survive. 
and if we assume that the tongue ability is indeed a mind probe, then that means that after the tragic ending of Episode 2, the Combine suddenly knows all about the Borealis, and Eli's teleportation research, and all sorts of other Rebellion secrets. Talk about a cliffhanger. Alright, on to the Meshuga rant. Half-Life has a great little story about good triumphing over the impossible odds of evil if you just look at the cutscenes, but there's so much more to Half-Life's storytelling that adds near endless depth to its world, and a great amount of moral ambiguity too, as we see in Breen's unclear motivations. But let's backtrack a little bit to the single biggest mystery in Half-Life, the G-Man. Nobody even knows what this guy is really called, we've just been calling him G-Man because that was his model name in Half-Life 1, and yet for 20 years, everyone who's ever played a Half-Life game has racked their mind trying to figure out his story, and yet we still don't have anything outside of theories. Everything we know about Half-Life tells us that there must be some combination of the puzzle pieces, some angle of looking at things that could explain G-Man's origins and motivations, but we just haven't figured it out yet. In a way, this is the tragedy of Half-Life 3, and also the magic of it. A few years ago, on my birthday no less, Mark Laidlaw, the lead writer for Half-Life, released a letter from the perspective of Gordon Freeman recounting the events of Half-Life 3, and as far as I'm concerned, this is the canon ending to the series. It ends with Gordon and Alex traveling through a portal to the Combine Overworld, and realizing that there's countless citadels, and a Dyson Sphere in plain view, a Dyson Sphere being a theoretical device that surrounds an entire star, so that a civilization can harvest its energy losslessly. It just goes to show that throughout the entire Half-Life series, Gordon has been meddling in forces that he can't possibly comprehend, MIT education or no, and G-Man fits perfectly into that category. His motivations, his origin, his true form, his name, are all completely outside of our comprehension as mere humans. We get a few brief glimpses into the Combine's true power over the course of the completed Half-Life games, but like the G-Man, they're one puzzle piece that will never truly be able to fit with the rest, simply because they're too complicated. We know a lot about the Combine, they enslave planets, they augment those creatures cybernetically, and they send the slaves to conquer other planets. They see value in human creativity, they need to drain entire planets of their water, and they have the ability to copy minds into advisor pods. Beyond that though, we can't begin to comprehend the true scale of their operation. Are the Combine even sentient, or organic? It's perfectly possible, perhaps even most likely, that some species out in space created an AI that can assume them, and then spread out from planet to planet assimilating everything, like the Borg in Star Trek. But then, how does the Nihilant fit in? If it was helping Combine enslaved species escape to Earth, then why did G-Man help Gordon kill it, only to turn around and go to fight the Combine 20 years later? And assuming opposing forces canon, G-Man is the one who activated the nuke in Black Mesa to create the portal storm that allowed the Combine to get to Earth. Then we have the Vortigons, who were able to overpower G-Man when he tried to steal Gordon away after Half-Life 2. We'll see about that. Are they starting a rebellion of their own on their homeworld? Were these Earth Vortigons? How were they able to intercept Gordon, but not able to bring him out of stasis before the events of Half-Life 2? Who really knows? This is the true magic of Half-Life. It lets clever players figure out such an incredible amount of lore from the world, and then they leave a couple of the most important questions completely unanswerable. This is why fans care so much about getting a final Half-Life game. They asked us to work so hard to learn as much as we can about the world, only to deny us the ultimate answers that all of that information was supposed to lead to. But anyways, this isn't a pointless rant about why we need Half-Life 3. This is me celebrating the amount of careful and precise work that went into making a story that the whole internet was engaged with and trying to decipher. I mean, Half-Life is practically a niche game to still be playing nowadays, but there's still plenty of people trying to unlock this game's secrets 15 years later. And that's no accident. It's simply the way that the game was designed, and as far as storytelling in an FPS goes, to this day, it's the most elegant, stylish, engaging, and skillful job of it that we've ever seen.